Shalom, friends. Happy Tuesday. Great to see you. Thank you for being here for class 25 of Pearls of Kindness. Thank you so much. We're going to talk about Miniat Nekama, not taking revenge as an act of kindness, as an act of kindness. So let's start with a poll question here. I believe about revenge that the desire for revenge is natural, normal, and okay. B, that the desire for revenge is evil and must be restrained and destroyed. Option C, revenge can serve its purpose, but should at times be limited. Hard choices, huh? <laughs> okay. Okay, we got a, a little bit of a balance here, 17% that the desire for revenge is natural, normal, and okay. 67%, I can't read the full line anymore, but that the desire for revenge is evil and must be restrained and um, eradicated or something like that. And option three, revenge can serve its purpose, but should at times be limited. Okay, very interesting. So let's dive in together, friends. Lots to think about here today. Happy election day, by the way. Hope everyone has voted already. Of course, I would never try to sway or influence one's vote, um, but everyone should vote for the side of good and not for sides of evil, for, aside for people who vote for people who support democracy and not people who want to destroy it. People should vote for those who want to um, help the vulnerable and stand up for minorities rather than um, build up uh, pyramids of supremacy. Um, but you know, we'll all make our own votes and um, hopefully we've done that already or are doing that today. So, and whatever the results are, we shouldn't take revenge. <laughs> yes, we should fight for good, but perhaps not take revenge. Or maybe we should, maybe we should, we'll find out in this class. Maybe we should have, have ruthless revenge. Maybe we're gonna learn in this class. Like, like, like just the most intense. Um... <laughs> good luck, my American friends. Thank you from, from Canada. Um, yeah, praying for our democracy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We've got a few Canucks, uh, a few Canucks here on the on the Zoom as usual. So, friends, why would not taking revenge be a kindness? We may feel we are hardwired to believe that those who hurt us ought to be hurt, or at the very least, they have we have a right to take revenge upon those who hurt us. And perhaps we may even think that the only true justice is for us to directly hurt them. We feel revenge is just and deserved. Why then should refraining from taking revenge be co potentially considered a chesed, a pearl of kindness? In order to address this question, we need to first explore the negative commandment itself. The Torah is clear about the mandate to avoid revenge. It says over here in Vayikra, one should not take revenge or bear a grudge against the people of your nation. Now that, going back to our poll question, that doesn't say that the emotion itself is not uh, natural or that the desire for revenge itself is a problem. It just says we shouldn't act on it, shouldn't take revenge. Interesting enough here, the verse just before this one we just quoted is, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. That emerges just before this. Perhaps this juxtaposition an order of verses is hinting to us that one of the goals of removing hate from the heart is to remove it from action. Conversely, perhaps the Torah is telling us that in order to prevent hate from turning to action, we must first remove it from our heart. Further, we intuitively know that we should react to every action against us from a place of measured reason with a commitment to justice rather than from an unstable place of anger. The Talmud addresses this very point, distinguishing between the two prohibitions mentioned in the above verse, taking revenge and bearing a grudge. It says over here in the Talmud of Yoma, sometimes pronounced Yuma, 
I will, which is even more funny if you're from the city of Yuma, <laughs> which most people in the world haven't heard of. Most Talmud scholars in the history of the world have never, who called this, called this tractate Yuma, never heard of the city of Yuma. I will not lend my item to you just as you refuse to lend me your sickle. This is Nikama, revenge. Here is my item. I am not like you who would not lend me what I asked for. This is Netira, bearing a grudge. You see the difference there? Let me say it again. I will not lend you this thing just as you refuse not to lend it to me. That is Nekama, revenge. Here is, here is my item. I am going to lend you what you asked because I'm not like you who wouldn't lend it to me. This is Netira, bearing a grudge. So in one case, the revenge is not doing the help for another, not doing the kindness for another because they didn't do it for us. And the bearing a grudge is doing it, but explaining that I am better than you when I am actually doing it. So that's, that's not definitional in the English language about grudges or revenge. That's definitional in Talmudic language around nekama and netira, the difference between bearing a grudge and showing revenge. Both examples of nekama and netira provided by the rabbis are reactions out of anger and resentment. Reacting in such a manner may be understandable and may not even be viewed as overreacting, but according to the rabbis, is forbidden just the same. Restraining our desire to take revenge may benefit not only the subject of our wrath, but also ourselves. We may refrain from taking revenge for our own sake, as revenge has the ability to destroy a person. It's a pernicious emotion, an all-encompassing, infinitely heavy shackle to bear. Maimonides teaches us about how destructive anger can be and how cautious we must be codifying Jewish law to oppose its destructive use. Here's what Maimonides, or the Rambam, writes in his Mishnah Torah. There are certain character traits that one must distance oneself from in the extreme. In fact, it is forbidden to take the standard approach of the middle path regarding these character traits. Right? Reminder, um, Maimonides is Aristotelian, and so he loves the middle ground. He loves the golden mean, and yet while he thinks the golden mean is great for a whole lot of things, he does have some exceptions, such as this. Anger is an extremely negative character trait, and it is fitting for a person to distance themselves from it to the opposite extreme. One should train oneself never to become angry, even regarding things for which anger might be justified. Those who frequently become angry have no quality of life. Therefore, the sage has instructed us to distance ourselves from anger to the farthest degree until a person acts as though they do not sense even those things that would justifiably, justifiably anger a person, right? So um, on money, Maimonides says middle path, don't be stingy and don't give away all your money, right? When it comes to food, don't starve yourself and don't overindulge, find a middle path of moderation, right? But there are some exceptions and anger is an exception. He says, there's no middle path. Any level of anger is going to be destructive for you and for others around you. Now, I know we talk about an activism today, righteous indignation. I know we talk in psychology about the inevitability of, of anger that can't be er eradicated on some level. And he's merely saying, do what you can, do what you can. We all have different challenges and each of us can take this on to a certain degree. And that is of course connected to revenge or a, a passion crime. Maimonides' words certainly apply to the examples of revenge um, that the rabbis gave, as they can be viewed as non-extreme, yet are nonetheless strong. Wisdom in a state of anger. Furthermore, sinat chinam, baseless hatred, is considered the catalyst for the destruction of the temple, akin to the worst offenses idolatry, sexual immorality, and murder, right? Hatred. And that hatred is um, connected to this level of resentment as it emerges in Nekama. Okay, the Talmud relates a well-known story to illustrate this point. This is a story you may have heard before, oftentimes um, uh, on Tisha B'Av, which is why I chose that melody earlier of Imeshka which is often associated with Tisha B'Av. 
um, which is the commemoration of hatred and the destruction that emerges from hatred. Here's what it says in the Talmudic tractate of Gittin, the tractate of divorces. Jerusalem was destroyed on account of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. There was a certain man whose friend was named Kamsa and whose enemy was named Bar Kamsa. He once made a large feast and said to his servant, go bring me my friend Kamsa. The servant went and mistakenly brought him his enemy, Bar Kamsa. The man who was hosting the feast came and found Bar Kamsa sitting at the feast. The host said to Bar Kamsa, you are my enemy. What, what then do you want here? Arise and leave. Bar Kamsa said to him, since I have already come, let me stay and I will give you money for whatever I eat and drink. Just do not embarrass me and send me out. The host said to him, no, you must leave. Bar Kamsa said to him, I will give you money for half of the feast. Just do not send me away and embarrass me. The host said to him, no, you must leave. Bar Kamsa then said to him, I will give you money for the entire feast. Just let me stay. Don't embarrass me. The host said to him, no, you must leave. Finally, the host took Bar Kamsa by his hand, stood him up and took him out. After having been cast out from the feast, Bar Kamsa said to himself, since the sages were sitting there and did not protest the actions of the host, although they saw how humiliated, how he humiliated me, learn from it that they were content with what he did. I will therefore go and inform against them to the king. He went and said to the emperor, the Jews have rebelled against you. So that's a really powerful story. And that story, uh, which we can unpack later if you're interested, because it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, to our, our, our contemporary moments and um, cancellations and kickouts and social alienation and the like. And we see here that this story is in, in the context of the destruction of the temple. And they're saying that it was this one act that hurt this person so bad that led him to go to the emperor to say the Jews have rebelled against you that led the emperor to them come and ransack Jerusalem, which is the reminder of the power of one person's actions and how that can influence in the world. Of course, we never blame Jews for anti-Semitism. Um, uh, we never should blame Jews for anti-Semitism, but contextually we can see how some Jewish actions might lead to um, an increase of hate for Jews. Um, and um, and that should that should inspire a lot of sensitivity in the choices we make. And not only was it his choice, but the fact that the good people around him stayed silent. They saw this man about to be humiliated and didn't intervene. They saw him being carried out and didn't intervene. And that is the uh, that is in fashion today. It is in fashion to live and let live, to not speak up when we see wrong things, right? Oftentimes. Um, it, it's not totally in fashion, but it's it's cer it's certainly uh, um, the norm, and so um, that's a very powerful Bar Kamsa story to remember. In response to sinat chinam, baseless hatred, Rav Avraham Yitzchak Hakohen Cook profoundly suggests that we go the opposite direction and seek to cultivate ahavat chinam, baseless love. With this in mind, we're now able to understand how refraining from taking revenge can potentially be categorized as an act of chesed, an act of baseless love, to not do wrong to one who wronged us, to not take that revenge. It doesn't mean that we don't pursue justice in the world, right? But revenge it would be a different category. We are to try to emulate God's ways, even when, and perhaps especially when, we've been hurt. The Torah mandates us to halachta bedracha, walk in God's ways. Just as God is forgiving, so must we be forgiven. In the Selichot, penitential prayers, we recite each year leading up to the high holidays. I had the privilege of, sit, of sit, reciting it with Gary this year. In articulating the 13 attributes of God, we recite by way of introduction, a description of the justice of God's actions. God deals righteously with all and does tzedek, does justice, pardoning chotim, he pardon, God pardons careless wrongdoers, and forgiving poshim, intentional wrongdoers. Forgiving others here is connected to tzedek. Forgiveness of those who have erred is a fulfillment of justice, an act of healing both individual relationships 
and the broader social fabric, restore, working towards restorative justice. Furthermore, one of God's 13 attributes is chesed. Part of what it means to be righteous and kind is to be a forgiver, to understand that humans are fallible and to therefore be loving of others who stumble even in their actions towards us. Friends, I was on an interfaith panel on capital punishment yesterday. And um, uh, there were a few um, different uh, faiths represented. represented. And, um, and I think that that issue also very much relates here. I would never tell the victim of an atrocity how they should feel. Um, if somebody, how they should feel towards the mass shooter at their school, how they should feel towards someone who took the life of their child. I would never, um, I would never tell them how they should feel um, or critique them for feeling um, deep anger um, or even desires for re revenge. And yet, thank God, the system of justice shouldn't be in the hands of people who are full of, uh, of rage ultimately. Um, that we can validate those emotions and yet still see that justice can operate on a level higher than um, the full desires of, of, of a victim. But that's open for conversation, and I hope we'll I, and I hope we'll go there. Rabbi Yisrael of Rizin distinguishes between two different types of forgivers. The soleach is one who occasionally forgives, and the solchan is one who forgives habitually, time and time again. Right? Maybe we can think in our own lives: Are we someone who had to have some big, grand, bold moment of forgiveness for a great wrong, or are we someone who, on a daily level, like feels wrong or gets wronged in some way? And, and it's just conditioned ourselves to say sorry. Are we a solchan or, so, or a soleach? To perpetuate opportunities to forgive and to repair relationships is to be a solchan. Some people hurt us so much that we cannot merely forgive them one time. Rather, we need to forgive that same person for the same act in our hearts time and time again in order to achieve full forgiveness. We can't say, oh, I forgive them long ago, right? In fact, um, we have to continually engage in that. This helps us not only to heal, but also to cultivate a very deep virtue of being a forgiver. This process has another step. Just as we are obligated to forgive others, so too are we commanded not to bear a grudge. Lo titur, what we talked about earlier, nitira. Uh, not bearing a grudge is an outgrowth of ahavat chinam, of baseless love and of forgiveness. In fact, the second half of the verse regarding nekama and nitira is comprised of the famous quote, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's all packaged together. Don't bear a grudge, right? Don't hate your, um, don't, don't, don't bear this grudge. Don't hate um, and love your neighbor as yourself. Forgiving another is about deeds of the past. Removing a grudge on the other hand is about a present and perhaps even a future sense of indebtedness. To truly love another, we must move beyond entitlement and release our grudges. How does this apply to our daily lives on a global scale? About a month before his assassination, in his second inaugural address, President Abraham Lincoln famously said, with malice toward none, with charity for all, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace. This is remarkable. This is remarkable. To engage in a civil war, I mean, we think, we think there's anger and tension on election day today. You know, threats of fraud, <laughs> you know, degrees of, of familial polarization, um, divisions, um, you know, and conspiracy theories and the like. Imagine that it's the day after not a contentious election, but the day after a civil war, right? And you now are pleading for malice toward none, right? Literally like you, the children of your city have been, have been um, become widows. Um, and, um, and, but Lincoln understood, of course you have a right to be angry as the North Right, what the South did was atrocious, fighting for slavery and the, and breaking from the Union and and uh, and a whole lot of other things and the and the atrocities of war. Um, and yet, 
I have a vision of a country. I have a vision of a society. And we're only going to get there if we can achieve this together. We observe historic choices as to whether to seek forgiveness and thereby to achieve its dramatic consequences. To be forgiving is to be courageous and take so much work. And leaders who try to heal longstanding conflicts often sadly pay with their lives. Another more, and by the way, I'm thinking also this week, I don't know whether I should go here or not. <laughs> Yitzhak Rabin, as you know, was assassinated by a religious extremist, an ultra, an ultra Orthodox extremist in Israel who was opposed to his peace. Um, actually, I don't know that he was ultra Orthodox. He, I think he was a religious Zionist extremist, actually. Um, um, Yigal Amir. And, um, but, but um, it's worth noting that some extremists were just entered, just entered into the Knesset, into Bibi Netanyahu's coalition. Whatever we think about Netanyahu, we can bracket that. But most people agree that, that Smutrich and Ben Gvir, that these are extreme people. And many of their past quotes and actions have shown that. And um, in regards to their participation in the hate rhetoric around Rabin before his assassination, should also be taken note. And so that very assassination that happened in many of your li lifetimes, um, in many of our lifetimes here, um, also, um, certainly in my lifetime, um, um, also is still alive today with the same level of extremist rhetoric. Anyways, another more contemporary example of taking Leviticus 19.18 seriously and pursuing a path of forgiveness is embodied in the recent history of South Africa. In 1994, bolstered by its political and religious leaders, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and soon to be President Nelson Mandela, South Africa conducted peaceful elections to elect its first black majority government. Then in spite of predictions that this government would unleash a vengeful bloodbath against the former apartheid white rulers, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission chaired by Nobel Laureate Tutu helped bring healing to the country. Instead of putting all the perpetrators, mostly white, on trial or granting a general amnesty that would do nothing to defuse the hatred, South Africa tried a different course. Archbishop Tutu wrote, they saw the process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. When perpetrators of some of the most gruesome atrocities were given amnesty in exchange for a full disclosure of the facts of the offense, instead of revenge and retribution, this new nation chose to tread the difficult path of confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Imagine in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if we could achieve something um, like this. Imagine if in America, uh, we've never had a truth and reconciliation process around slavery. Um, there's still a lot of this healing and testimony uh, to, hap to, to happen. Um, of course, in the Holocaust is a complicated uh, legacy. As long as the tur torture, tur torture torturers and murderers who acknowledge their crimes and ask for forgiveness, the victims would in turn forgive them, and the state would not pursue further action against their actions. Incredibly, this tactic avoided the violence that gripped so many other nations, such as Robert Gab Gabriel Mugabe's Zimbabwe and Mozambique, for, for, uh, formerly a Portuguese colony. Forgiveness is hard and sometimes seemingly impossible However, before we decide that we cannot forgive, we should consider the price of not seeking forgiveness and try to be both the sol Han who follows the command of Lotitor. As Archbishop Tutu points out, retribution leads to a cycle of reprisal, leading to counter reprisal in an ex in inexorable movement, as in Rwanda, Northern Ireland, and the former nation of Yugoslavia. The only thing that can break that cycle, making possible a new beginning is forgiveness. Without forgiveness, there is no future. There really is no better way to say it than in Archbishop Tutu's insightful words, without forgiveness, there is no future. It may, which it may, it may feel more just to take revenge, but we cannot build a world of kindness if everyone gets what they deserve and or have coming to them. Uh, what, everyone remembers Gandhi's famous phrase, um, you know, an eye for an eye makes the world blind. Is that the phrase? My friend, I wake the word blind. In Rashi's commentary on the first verse of the Torah, he explains that this world cannot be sustained on justice alone, but also on compassion. Here's how Rashi explains the first verse 
Bareshit bara Elohim at the Shemaim Veta Aretz. God created the heaven and the earth. It says Elohim created, right? Not Adoshem, not Adonai created, but Elohim created. It didn't say Hashem created. This is because in the beginning, God created, intended to create with the attribute of strict justice. But God saw that the world could not be sustained this way. And therefore, God preceded it with the attribute of compassion and joined it with the attribute of justice. As it says later on in Genesis 2, 4, on the day that Hashem Elohim made the heaven and the earth. To conclude here, friends, as partners of the divine, we too need to learn what it takes, that it takes kindness to sustain this all too broken world. And with this compassion, we will at times be slighted, sometimes more than slighted, and wish to mete out our justice. But barring a few extreme exceptions, we must seek to embrace and bear those injustices without seeking revenge, thereby doing our part to make this a better and kinder world. Okay, friends, I know this is a loaded topic and heavy for perhaps many of us based upon our, uh, our own experiences. So I would love to hear from you and I see uh, uh, Toby and then Gary. First, a uh, really short thank you to everybody in this group and to you, Rabbi, for having this group. You have you make my Tuesdays <laughs> happy. I love you. I love you all. Anyway, uh, now on to bigger and better things. Anyway, um, I'm a, a death penalty attorney. I'm sure most of you know that already. But in the early 2000s, I per, uh, participated in, an, in a restorative justice program that the then uh, uh, county attorney had in place. And it uh, required that both the defense and the victim's family be agreeable. But um, this particular case, it was a murder case, it was very unfortunate. It was uh, two young lovers, a 17 year old who was my client and his 15 year old girlfriend participated in a murder suicide pact. Anyway, needless to say, she died, he didn't. Uh, and he was charged with capital murder. And uh, of course, both people, both families were devastated. Um, the girl's family was distraught. And my, my client's family was, they didn't understand why it happened. Anyway, bottom line is they agreed to this restorative justice program wherein the two people actually met in a room, the victim's family and my client's family. And a similar sort of situation. They wanted to know what happened, what were her last moments like and things like that. It was, it was pretty gruesome from my point of view. I cried probably more than they did, but um, it, it ended up, uh, long story short, um, as far as I know, these two families are still supporting each other and communicate with each other, celebrate holidays together. Um, it's, an, it's an amazing thing. Is it rare? Absolutely. And this, the minute that that county attorney left office, that program was stopped. But it's, it's a, it gave a glimpse of what is possible even here in Arizona. Thank you, Toby, for sharing that. Thank you so much. Wow. Hi, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> uh, I wanna go back to uh, the Bar Comsa, Comsa discussion, uh, you know, I think I have this right, piku nefesh, one who saves uh, one person as if they saved the whole life, the whole world, rather. Uh, can we not say in that situation, and I think we see it today, for one that does not stand up for what is right, is this as if they've destroyed the whole world? Uh, I mean, I, I think we can say that here, at least in this country, where, where, where people just don't want to stand up and say the right thing because they have personal, not to get political, they have personal gain uh, but you know, I, I see that I see that an awful lot, and and it just to me kind of kind of uh, struck home. People don't people rather will remain quiet rather than to stand up and be counted uh, when they need to, you know. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to bring up, I think it was Rabbi uh, Avi Weiss. I think when he came into town, your mentor, uh, they said something to to the point uh, that if you have no reconciliation, uh, you can never have truth. And you can never have justice. Uh, I think there's something of that of, of that nature, and uh, I mean, I, I, we just I, I personally see that as we as we look around the country and look around the world, when when we really don't face what we did 
was wrong as a nation or as an individual, then then we just see the same situation that, that we're having in this country. We have this, this constant hatred uh, and we don't want to accept what we did was wrong or evil. And uh, we just want to push it off to the side and continue to move forward and make excuses uh, to continue to hate. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Yeah. Um, and I remember in that Rabbi Weiss speech, he, ta he talked about some of his activism in Europe where they were putting up crosses in concentration camps, like whether it was Birkenau or Auschwitz, where he got arrested in some of these places and beat up in some of these places. And, and, and kind of understanding, like, where do you fight for truth? Um, you know, and where do you work for that reconciliation? And it's, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult with uh, very hard questions, which I hope we'll continue to explore. And on your first point, I think you're totally right about from the Bar Kamsa story, learning to stand up to do what's right um, and not being silent when we see evil. Now, and I just want to remind folks because we have different degrees of comfort with tension or conflict, that there's many different ways to do that. Some people think, well, I'm not that person who's going to run into the city square and, you know, you know, um, stand in front of the, the barricade or, you know, and or get handcuffed. Well, that's not the only way to stand up, you know, uh, to not be silent in the face of evil. There's a whole lot of ways. And um, with Twitter being taken over by hate um, and just, uh, you know, just a reckless, uh, just a, a completely uh, reckless, hey, don't get me started uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, over there. But there are other places to speak up in person on social media to do it in quieter ways too. And the other way to do it also is to support, not always fight the fight the perpetrator, but support the victim. There's a whole lot of ways um, to speak up for good and not be silent. Um, I wonder the Bar Kamsa story, Gary, was did someone wait outside the door and walk him away, right? Maybe they said, ooh, I don't wanna, dis I don't wanna offend the host. The host must know something I don't know. So I'll let him kick him out. But then once he's outside, then will I walk him to his car, right, so, so to speak, right? So like what happens next? And so, um, yeah, so I appreciate that. And I and and because we're somewhat committed to pluralism, not only of, of faiths, of denominations, of ideologies, but the pluralism of different ways of acting and being in the world. Right. And when it comes to not being silent in the face of evil, there are so many creative ways for us to do that. And what I love is, um, when we see evil, like, and um, when we see evil every day, we should think like, what's my response? Am I gonna go online and donate some money? Am I gonna go show up somewhere and volunteer? Am I gonna call someone who might be feeling down about what just happened, right? What will be my response? It might be a two hour response. It might be a 30 second response, right? It might be an $18 response, it might be an $1,800 response. Right? What am I gonna do whenever I see something happen and to not be silent? And um, so yes, thank you for that. Hi, okay, Eileen and then Lauren. Oh yes, Gary, Gary. Oh yeah, question. what is one other thing? For yes. those that uh, lived here in Phoenix for a long time may have known Helen Handler. She was a Holocaust survivor. And uh, she was like our adopted mom and dad. And we were very close to her, but she, in, uh, she always said, you know, after the war, uh, you know, when the Jews were released from concentration camps, you know, they, they tried to pick up their lives. They didn't pick up rifles and go after the Germans to kill them, which is a very Jewish trait uh, compared to what we see so many times. Uh, uh, and she kind of kind of lived by that by that motto of uh, of uh, it's not not writing off what was done to them, but moving on with their lives and educating the world. So, uh, yeah. that kind of you know, there. thank you, thank you, Gary, for that. And um, now that's post Holocaust. I do want to share one story that we're familiar with in the Holocaust that I I um uh, I think is worth putting on the table in the in the Warsaw 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 ghetto uprising. Um, they knew they had no chance of winning. Um, they just felt like we've got some weapons, and let's not die like sheep. And this is a little bit of a dignity in our lives. Now, I would not call that revenge. Um, I don't think there was any moral obligation upon them to passively die like sheep in front of the Nazis, nor am I, am I blaming people who did die without fighting back. I'm not blaming anyone. Um, 
But I do think that form of resistance while the conflict, while the conflict, while the genocide was still happening um, is one that I find inspiring. Um, I, I rarely find acts of violence inspiring, but I think the form of uh, Nazi resistance in that ghetto, uh, knowing they were gonna be slaughtered, I think was something powerful. And I think Gary's point really resonates for me that once the war is done, yes, there need to be trials. There need to be trials, but we don't just pick up rifles and go Nazi hunting, right? And so thank you, Gary. Okay, I lean over to you and then Lauren. Um, I want to just point out on an individual level, living with revenge as your goal turns you into a really despicable person. It alters your personality. It causes all sorts of consequences which were probably unintended. And then that kind of, it's like a stone in a pond and the ripples just spread from this. Yes, thank you for that, Eileen. It, it really is true. And, and I, I, I would never blame someone in this situation, but one of the, the, one of the sad parts of weddings I facilitate is when um, people who have been divorced are, are unwilling to be at the same wedding as they're, um, they're unwilling to be in the same space as their ex. And this poor child, not, I mean, not to mention not willing to walk down the aisle together on the other side of their child, um, but not even willing to be at that place. And um, again, I'm not blaming those people because I don't know the context of those uh, divorces. Um, and, and, you know, rage, I mean, a divorce is probably one of the most common forms of, of deep anger, but, um, but there are forms of of there are forms of revenge that um, that um, that emerge, which hurt children more than even that spouse they're trying to hurt, and um, and we see this thing all the time. I mean, going back to Twitter, I know I don't want to go back to Twitter, but with the immediate firing of people, the not even the people that may have been strategic business wise, but the the initial the people up top that um, were, were, were clearly revenge driven, right? It's like, and what tone that set for the whole so global social media platform of how we, what's the ethos of this space, right? When, when, when it's built around such, a, such an ethos. Yes, hi, Lauren. Hi, um, a few things, one, <clears throat> sorry, it's my allergies. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, um, Eileen is right, the, sorry. <clears throat> oh, no problem. The, um, that feeling of revenge eats at you. I, I can't even begin to tell you, such a nice person like me, the fantasies I had about what I would do to my ex-husband and his lawyer. But anyways, I never acted on it. And I got to the point where I actually, um, it, it, well, yeah, forgive my ex. Um, Anyways, no, I wanted to say, like, what happened in South Africa was actually amazing. And we're trying to go through that process right now in Canada with our First Nations. My, my feeling is that a lot of the problem with the right wing in the U.S. is a lot of them never got over the end of slavery or the end of Jim Crow and are wanting to see a return to it. And of truth and reconciliation, something really really needed. The other thing I want to say, though, however, is um, there were some Jews who did take revenge on Nazis. And I believe that there were some Israelis that took revenge on uh, the perpetrators of the massacre in Munich. And I don't know, I can't judge them because what happened was so horrific. Um, maybe it's definitely better not to do such a thing. But my God, especially when it comes to the Nazis, how can how can you not like really understand it? Anyways, that's all I have to say. Yeah, thank you. And so one of the moves I make there is uh, that certainly not critiquing those who are in a state of shock and trauma, um, seeking revenge, but rather to elevate and amplify the voices of those who are in a state of shock and trauma but are still promoting reconciliation. So if you look at the school shootings, for example, um, and I know these are very emotional issues for, for all of us, 
Um, there are those who are really um, seeking revenge. And I don't wish to critique them um, who lost their children in these horrific shootings. I just wanna amplify the voices of those who wanna find productive ways to move forward. Um, and so I, I, I appreciate that, that point, Lauren. And I also wanna remind us of the Ir HaMiklat. The Ir HaMiklat is an institution in the Bible where there were no prisons in the Torah. And so the two alternatives to prison were um, avdut, slavery. You, right, if you have a debt, remember debtor's prison? If you have a debt, you don't go to jail. Like, who does that help? You work off your debt. You work off your debt. I, I've sometimes wondered if we should, rather than just have bankruptcy, <laughs> we should have people work off their debt. I know that's not, that might sound cruel to some, but, you know, creditors are also, you know, owed something. And um, is filing bankruptcy enough sometimes? I don't know. I don't know. It's a question. <laughs> but um, so one form of, of <clears throat> alternative to prison was, um, was a form of servitude that you had to work off your debt. The other thing was called this Irhamikla, the city of refuge. And it was a place that if you accidentally killed someone, you could flee to this city. But the person who loves the person that you accidentally killed has the right, or maybe not right, but um, is not punished if they do, um, the right to, to pursue you. And if they pursue you, not, not you, to pursue that person, pursue that person on their way to the city of refuge. Once they get to the city of refuge, they are safe. But while they're running, it sounds like a children's game, right? Like capture the flag or something. But while, while the person is fleeing to the city of refuge, the rabbis understood that a, a, a passion crime is gonna be a mitigating factor, right? And that we understand that American law today too, right? That you're gonna to try to reduce someone's sentence to show this person was, was in a state of rage or this person was reacting to something that had just happened. And so too, the rabbi said, if they were in a state of revenge, they will not be accountable for having killed that person. Others think it actually was justice. So that's another important model to kind of put on the table uh, to unpack this a little bit. Um, okay, Steve, Sarah, um, Eric, uh, I don't know who Mono is, but maybe Mono or Eddie or Alex. Anyone we didn't hear from yet? Hi, Steve. Hi, hi. Uh, I'm sorry I came in late and you might have covered this. Um, th there is a difference between seeking punishment and, and, and revenge. And I don't know if you talked about that. Number two, the person I'm seeking forgiveness from the most is me. And I, I just, I get really come down hard on myself for not treating people as 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 great as I think they should be treated. I I, I don't know how to explain it. I, I'm always falling short of my own expectations for myself. And so I have these battles with myself. But don't worry, I don't I'm not seeking revenge in myself. Um mm -hmm. it it it's is something that troubles me a lot. And num number three, and, and Eileen and, and Lauren both kind of covered this. When, when you s seek revenge and have these horrible feelings, it just rips you apart. And this, this might sound so small compared to the big things in life. There's a guy I played pickleball with, and he's a phenomenal athlete. And he lets everybody know it. And he beats the heck out of me all the time. And that's okay because everybody else does. And I, I just love the game. But this guy is so aloof and so dour and so full of himself that I start having bad feelings. And the only way I could think of not having bad feelings was to approach him and compliment him on his game and try to figure out what the heck was going on with all of his superciliousness. And... I, I said, not only is your game great as uh, athletically, but you look like you're doing ballet 
when when you when you hit the ball, which, which he does, he's he's phenomenal. And he came down off of his tower with that small statement, and suddenly we talked for like half an hour. It was wonderful to get rid of the thing that Eileen and Lauren uh, was talking about. I felt so relieved. I, I know I'm kind of wandering here. No, not wondering at all. I love your points. I love your points. I'm. I want to reflect just briefly on two of them, and then I want to open one of them up for for people's engagement. Um, on this last point, I'm very inspired by this point about how we're so many people are wearing masks in the world, and those masks sometimes really offend us. Um, they they come off as arrogant, they come off as um, rude, um, and oftentimes those masks are covering up hurt. And sometimes just an act of kindness and warmth to someone like you demonstrated there, and I'm sure you do all the time, um, was able to enable this person to take their mask off and engage with you on a deeper level. And of course, there's some people that it is no mask, like what, what you see is what you get, you know, but, <laughs> but, um, but that, you know, my experience is more like what Steve just shared, that if you show a soft spot to this person that they will, they will change as well. So I love that, and that's inspiring. And on another point you shared um, in regards to forgiving ourselves, I don't want to say much about that, just kind of amplify the, you know, the, the um, importance of that, us thinking about that. Um, but, but, but your first point is one I want to throw back to the group. When is punishment different than revenge? Because Steve is correct that Judaism and any moral um, agent b uh, believes in some form of pun punitive justice. Um, punishments are necessary for a just society. And yet, as we're saying, revenge can be toxic and destructive in many ways. So when, and maybe it's easier if I take it out of the abstract. Let's take two eight-year-old eight -year kids on the playground. And one eight-year-old kid punches the other eight-year-old kid. Okay, now what would be punishment and what would be revenge? So the other eight-year-old decides I'm not gonna punch back, right? I'm not gonna do that. But I wanna make sure that the kid who punched me is punished. So when is that desire for the, the puncher to be punished seeking of a just form of punishment because that kid hit me? And when is it revenge? I'm curious to hear people's engagement on that. Yes, Lauren. I think you have to look at what happens in sports. I know from hockey, not much else. But I mean, if somebody, okay, there's too much fighting, I agree. But if there's somebody does something really awful, you know, like bangs a guy's head into the boards, they're dark games. They have to sit out. And, you know, revenge would be if his teammates came and beat him up. You know, I mean, if, if the, the victim's teammates came and beat up the perps, um, but <clears throat> justice is docking the person. So the same thing with the kid. One kid punches another. It would be amazing if the eight-year-old doesn't punch back. But if the eight-year-old doesn't punch back and tells people, then the kid that punched deserves some kind of justice so that they know that that's not the right thing to do be it that you're grounded you can't play the game for a while so that's what i see is the difference mm -hmm. yeah eric wrote correction absolutely it should be a correction a correction yeah yeah interesting so it's interesting we're thinking about this um uh right now as well um you know around the rise of anti-semitism I mean, I, I don't think any of us are expecting some heartfelt apology from Kanye West. I think that's the, you know, that fellow is, woo. But uh, when it comes to the player on the Brooklyn Nets, for example, you know, and his putting out there this anti-Semitic film that, you know, challenges, the, you know, the truth of the Holocaust and things like that, his unwillingness to apologize and own it, and the Nets now suspending him, right? At what point, like, does, does an all-star athlete like that get to return, right? Right, at what point is it just, there's a punishment because we don't want people filled with hate representing, you know, the NBA or representing our team. And at what point does it turn into a revenge of like, you know, and that, that touches on this issue of cancel culture 
also. Like, at what point do we say, you know, you're canceled, right? Because um, that's what the punishment deserves or that's what my revenge desires uh, versus, versus at what point do we say, um, you know, um, we're not going to do that because we don't want to have revenge. Okay, so I see Sarah and then Eric and then Toby. There are so many um, different questions on the floor right now. Uh, so the first one was Steve, uh, when he talked about his anger towards himself, just he put me back at the beginning, or at least where I managed to come in between baseless hate and baseless love. And I think all of us are trying to live in there somewhere towards ourselves and towards other people and often towards others. Yeah, there are acts that we may see, but so often it's the stories we're telling ourselves and we keep repeating until we actually, it becomes truth. And as far as kids go, I mean, with an eight-year-old who's hitting someone else, I'd be looking at the family. Who's hitting this child? You know, where is he learning this behavior? And often he's the one who's being hit at home. And so anyone else is game because he knows that this is how it is in the world. You have to hit somebody else because it hurts too much not to. Um, the last part of it was, uh, when do we, how do we see things in the world? And I think it goes back to the reconciliation and looking at our stories and insisting that we put the damn story out there on the table and say, okay, is that absolutely true? How do you feel when you believe that truth? Because when we simply punish people for their anti-Semitism or whatever else, they see that as a bigger piece of this conspiracy of Jews or whomever to silence them and they become more vehement in that, in that truth of theirs and more willing and angry and violent. So those are my random thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. Over to you, Eric. Beautiful. Are you, oh, Eric, you, are you typing? Okay, so I, I'm, Eric can't speak, so I'm gonna read what he wrote here. Eric Werner writes, um, we as a society advocate justice, not revenge. We apply examples, distinguish justice from revenge, such as impartiality, neutral, neutrality. But sometimes there are avenues where revenge can influence the proceedings and the impact of justice. My question is, what is the most prevalent avenue those seeking revenge erode the road of justice? Anyone want to take a stab at that? What is the most prevalent avenue those seeking revenge erode the, the road of justice? Okay, let's keep that question hanging. Uh, and if anyone wants to write in the chat, respond to Eric's uh, thoughtful point here. Toby, back to you. In response to your question about when do we, when does, at what point do, it does justice change into revenge? When the behavior changes, then it's not revenge. If I if I'm punishing an eight year old uh, mm -hmm. for doing something that they shouldn't have done, first of all, you need to explain to them. Here's here's the deal. This is why this is not okay, and this this is what we're going to do. Because at eight, I think they're at least logical enough to understand that certain things are not acceptable. Um, to explain to them, this is why we're doing this, and this is the, you know things have consequences. This is the consequence for the behavior that you exhibited. And when you change your behavior, you don't have to change your thought. You don't have to like the kid that you hit. That's, that's not part of it. But what you have to do is to stop hitting kids, mm -hmm. you know, to explain to the kid, this is, this is how the behavior needs to change. And when it does, we will stop punishing you. Mm -hmm. And that might work for adults too. Um, although I'm, 
I'm not sure. I think kids are probably easier. Yeah. Okay, friends. So I, I, um, I, I hope we'll all take a few minutes after to examine a little, um, some of the hurts we might still have. Um, many of the hurts we st might still have. Um, I mean, that would take more than a few moments and I'm, <laughs> and I'm sure we're doing that all the time, but perhaps on an abstract level where some of those hurts are actually contained and where they are still kind of pouring over into a form of, of seeking revenge. And how is that hurting us before we even get to how it's hurting someone else? How is some of the hurt we still have for not forgiving ourselves, for not forgiving someone else? How is that potentially still hurting? And can we loosen our grip just a little bit on that desire for revenge? Aglaia, you get the last word here. Okay, so because people were asking for me. Okay, I completely goofed with the time change. I'm really sorry about that. Okay, long story short, though, um, in the talking about our own individual hurts and the all issue of revenge and everything like that, um, I will just say this. Speaking from a place of I did have an individual hurt that I was trying to get this person to understand for like forever. Do you realize what you've done to me and everything, though? And he just was not getting it. He just was not going to get it. Well, eventually I had to actually just step back and say, okay, well, it doesn't matter that he gets it or does it matter more that I get it? And so I guess um, it comes from this um, place of in order for me to actually see that forgiving him was for me, not so much for him. That's where I had to go. Now, I'm really sorry I missed everything though, but I completely screwed up with the um, time change. But it also means that, you know, I, when it comes to self forgiveness, I have to forgive myself for screwing up the time change though. But uh, <laughs> interestingly enough though, but also if you see um, when it comes to self forgiveness, okay, if you look at self forgiveness though in the same way, are you doing it to say that what you did was okay? Are you doing it to say, you know, I need to, you know, heal something inside, so. Yes, yes, great. Great friends. May we all uh, bring a little bit more kindness in the world today and be inspired know that, knowing that each of us in the group here is working to do that together as well. Have a great day.